Hello, everyone, and welcome to another recorded lecture of Bio One Online. Today, we'll be discussing animal behavior in Chapter 36. So before we start talking about the behavior of animals, it's often helpful to compare how humans and animals are different, right? So humans are animals. We are considered animals. Um, we are primates, to be specific. And sometimes humans like to think of themselves as not animals, right? Sometimes humans like to think about themselves as a category on their own. Um, but in reality, right, there's a good quote. Humans are not degraded by being compared to animals, but animals are elevated by being compared to humans, right? So we're not doing ourselves any injustice by comparing ourselves to animals, but we can actually help promote um, the, the preciousness of animals by, by comparing them to humans. And in fact, right, all animals have a lot in common, humans included. And when we discuss animal behavior, it is tempting to anthropomorphize, which means to attribute human qualities um, onto non-human organisms, but it is unscientific to do so. Um, so again, when we play with our cats and dogs and they lick and they purr, we like to think that they're showing us affection, uh, but we're not really sure if that's the case, right? We don't know if affection and love as we know it is strictly a human uh, phenomenon where there's no way to know what a cat or dog is actually feeling. Um, so we have very um, we have limitations on how much we could know on animal behavior and in reality i would say arguably now more than ever we've never been less in tune with the natural world around us right now we're bombarded with uh, our phones and social media and the news the last thing we're looking at are the different types of squirrel species across the street and uh, we're not really noticing the different kinds of insects around. Whereas our human ancestors, right, 10,000 years ago, needed to know exactly what species were around. They needed to be able to smell the presence of a predator. Um, so again, we adapted by using different parts of our brain. Uh, now, right, we don't really need to pay as much attention to nature. Um, but that is not a good thing, right? So now is an opportunity for us to get back in touch with our natural roots and to understand how humans share a lot of behaviors with other animals. So ethology is the scientific study of animal behavior, uh, especially in the natural environment. So an ethologist would study how and why animals behave the way they do. Uh, this field emerged in the 30s, and it was led by um, Nico Timbergen, Carl von Frisch, and Conrad Lorenz. Um, and this is a little different from comparative psych. Uh, so comparative psych and ethology are both sciences that study animal behavior, typically non-human animal behavior. Um, but comparative psych belongs to psychology, right? And ethology belongs to biology. So ethology is the biological perspective on animal behavior. And the emphasis on ethological studies is on experiments. So a lot of experiments can be conducted in nature to help explain why animals behave they do in their natural environments. So ethology combines parts of ecology, right, study of the environment, with uh, psychology and biology. So now we're going to look at a strange animal behavior by the dung beetle. So we see here this beetle, um, it was once called a scarab beetle in ancient Egypt, is forming a mound of feces, as you can see here. And they are spending quite a bit of energy moving these balls of feces around. And if you saw this in nature, I'm sure you'd be scratching your head a little bit, saying, what is going on? Why are they spending all their time making these mounds of uh, feces and moving them around. So an ethologist would definitely have some, some questions. And there are two types of questions we can ask. The first is, how is this happening? Like physiologically, how is this happening? We call that the proximate causation. So what is allowing the beetle to do what it's doing? So that we can explain by hormones and neurons and muscles and metabolism. So we can say that this beetle is utilizing glucose 
for energy, which can help power its nervous system and its muscles to push this ball um, in a certain direction. All right, so that's how the behavior actually occurs. And we could do experiments to reveal how the proximate or how the behavior occurs. All right, so for example, if I can say this gene is responsible for the beetle moving this dung ball. And if I disable that gene, it would no longer be able to do it. So I can be convinced with an experiment that the proximate cause, right, is because of a certain gene, right? That's the how it actually happens, right? So we could say the dung beetle uses glucose as energy to control its exoskeleton and muscles in order to move the dung in its nest, right? That's the proximate cause. How does it happen? The ultimate causation is why it happens. And not only why it happens, but why is it evolutionarily adaptive? Why does this behavior promote the survival and reproduction of this organism? The answer is an interesting one. So for the dung beetle, the beetle actually lays its eggs inside the dung. And this provides the eggs with protection and also with nutrients for it to develop. So this behavior, the ultimate causation, right, is because it will, the beetle will contribute its genes to the next generation and it will increase the likelihood of survival. So again, to recap, we saw this behavior. We said, hmm, what is going on here? Well, there's two kinds of causes. There's the proximate cause of what's going on. And that's because the beetle's moving its exoskeleton um, uh, using energy from glucose, etc. But the other causation is the why, well, it's doing this so it can preserve its offspring, right? And it wants to have the best chance of the offspring surviving. So these are the two kinds of questions that an ethologist can ask, both questioning the proximate causation and the ultimate causation. And I'd like you to watch this video in the ebook um, that talks about the different proximate and ultimate causes of different animal behaviors. You can watch this at the end of the lecture as well, but it's definitely important to understand. So pause here and I'd like you to answer this rapid response question. So remember that ultimate causations are the why it happens. So if males present females with food as an offering, that would be C, right? Males that provide food will increase the quality of their offspring, right? That's the why they're doing it, where the other ones can be how they're doing it. C talks about why they're doing it. So an ethologist would traditionally classify animal behaviors based on the way that they're acquired and based on how changeable they are. So all animals, right, including us humans, are born with the ability to perform some behaviors, while other behaviors must be learned. So an animal's behavior may be innate, if we are born with that ability, or they're born with that ability, or must be learned. An innate behavior is instinctive. Right? And we can say that there is the biological programming for that. A learned behavior requires previous experience. And that could occur as early as, as birth. So we'll talk about, um, in the next couple of slides, different behaviors that are innate versus learned. So innate behaviors do not require experience. Learned behaviors require experience. Those are the big difference. So I'm going to give you a couple of examples of innate behaviors. A reflex is an example of an innate behavior. It's an instantaneous response. So if you move your hand, um, so if you touch a hot burner, you will instantly move your hand. That is something you do not need to be taught, right? Your mother doesn't have to say, when do you touch a hot stove, you move your hand away. You're going to do that automatically. In fact, your spinal cord does that uh, or mediates that kind of movement. Your brain isn't even involved until after the fact when you perceive pain. So we are built, we are programmed, right? As I'm saying we as human animals, but all animals have certain programming um, innately and previous experiences do not alter the behavior, right? So no matter what, you're gonna continue to, to um, move your hand away from a hot burner, always. Another type of innate behavior is called taxis. So taxis is movement toward or away from a stimulus. So for example, earthworms um, automatically move toward moist soil 
They don't have to be taught to do that. They're just born knowing to go toward the moist soil. Cockroaches are born innately to just go away from the light. Um, so these are very um, primitive behaviors. So taxis and reflexes are both innate. Another type of innate behavior is called a fixed action pattern. And this is a little more complex than taxis or reflexes. And a fixed action pattern is once a stimulus initiates a response, that response continues to completion even when the stimulus is withdrawn. So I'll give you a couple of examples. So in other words, it's a motor response that's initiated by some kind of environmental stimulus and it continues even without the stimulus. So a couple of examples uh, will illustrate this very easily. So it, so since fixed action patterns are innate, that means that they're genetically determined and they're inherited. They don't have to be learned. They're not based on previous experience, experience at all. Um, one such fixed action pattern is found in gray lag geese. So geese have this behavior called egg retrieval, where if they see an egg outside of their nest, they automatically um, bring it toward the nest. What's interesting is if a, ge a goose sees an egg and starts to move it, and then a scientist takes the egg when it's over here and just removes the egg, the goose will continue to move this invisible object toward the nest as if it's still there. So again, the stimulus was an egg was outside of the nest and the goose saw that egg, that was the stimulus, and it started to do this behavior, this fixed action pattern, which putting it back in the nest. But even when there wasn't an egg, even when the, the stimulus was withdrawn, when the scientist took the egg away, the goose didn't care and it continued to do that. It's a fixed action pattern. Right? Um, and another follow-up experiment, even when a stone or another round object was placed outside of the nest, the goose did the same thing. So it's kind of programmed to locate a round object outside of its nest and will move it toward in the nest. And again, we can think about proximate causation and ultimate causation for that behavior. Um, aggression in stickleback fish is another um, example of fixed action patterns. And this was done by Nico Tinbergen. So these are called three-spined sticklebacks fish, and they're very aggressive. Males are very um, aggressive. And so he was wondering why do, what, what is actually causing aggression? in these males, because when a male recognizes another male, they uh, start attacking. Uh, so what they what Nico did was he designed models of fish and even uh, so accurate models and very simple models. And he saw that even a very simple model of a fish with a red underside was enough to stimulate aggression in a male stickleback fish. If he gave a very realistic model of a male stickleback fish without the red underside, there is no aggression. So apparently a male stickleback is pretty much programmed to threaten any intruding male, right? But it only recognizes the red underside of the male. And if you were to withdraw, if you showed the stickleback fish this little model and you withdrew it, you took it away, it would still attack as if it were still there. So there is this stimulus in the red um, underbelly that stimulates this behavior. And even when this fish was removed, the this male stickleback fish was still aggressive. And again, let's think about why this is good. Um, but this is helping the male ensure that he has less competition from other males. Um, another fixed action pattern is yawning in humans, actually. So when one person yawns in a large group, it is likely for other people to start yawning, even if the yawn is stopped, right? Even when one person stopped yawning, one yawn is enough to stimulate other people's yawns in the vicinity. So that's another example of a fixed action pattern. A final example of a fixed action pattern is in courtship behavior in fruit flies. And I'll talk about that at the next slide. So the fruit fly has to undergo six specific steps in order to mate. And this would be considered a fixed action pattern, right? Once um, mating starts, this is a very, this is a programmed series of steps for mating. 
uh, that is controlled by genes, right? Flies don't have to be taught how to do this. They're born knowing how to uh, undergo these series of mating steps. And scientists have determined that a gene called fruitless is responsible for developing the motor responses of this behavior. So normally, the fruitless encodes transcription factors that are required for proper development of motor neurons that innervate muscles involved in courtship. So all of these are muscle movements um, that are controlled by genes. And it was discovered, actually, fun fact, the first lab I ever worked in um, was at Brandeis University in Jeff Hall's lab, and he studied this. This was the first um, project I was ever on, was studying fruitless mutant flies that were unable to court members of the opposite sex because they didn't have this gene. Um, and he later won the Nobel Prize in 2017, actually, um, for work around this and the circadian rhythm in flies. But that's a side fact. Um, so this just shows that genes are responsible for controlling a lot of these fixed action patterns. So we're born with the programming, um, or these flies are born with the programming on how to mate. Um, and without a certain gene, they're unable to do that. Um, and in some cases, they are unable to mate at all. In some cases, males will try to copulate with other males. Um, at one point, they, they some people drew connections to homosexuality with this behavior, but we really know that it's not. We can't really compare um, uh, courtship and flies to homosexuality in mammalian species. Um, but there's definitely evidence that genes, right, are controlling our courtship behaviors. There are we are born with certain instructions um, on how to promote survival and reproduction. So now we'll talk about learned behaviors. And learned behaviors are altered based on experience. Whereas all the other behaviors we, we spoke about so far, those innate behaviors, those are going to happen the same way every time, regardless of experience. But learned behaviors are flexible, right? And they're altered as an outcome of what an animal experiences in their environment. And there's different kinds of learning. So a simple way we can describe learning is how these chimpanzees learn to use tools by watching other members of their social group. They're making an association between an action and then getting um, a reward. So we'll talk about different kinds of learning that affect behavior. We'll talk about imprinting, habituation, associative learning, and associative learning um, includes classical and operant conditioning. I'll talk about observational learning and cognition. So these are all ways of learning that affect behavior. So we'll talk about imprinting first. And during imprinting, an animal forms an irreversible bond with the first moving object it sees within the first few hours of life. So it's a very rapid learning that occurs in a very restricted time period in development. But this, once this happens, um, it is fixed for life. Um, so imprinting strongly affects behavior. So improper imprinting is very difficult to reverse. Uh, in a very famous experience, uh, a famous experiment, um, Lorenz, the, um, one of the leaders of ethology uh, in the 30s, found that geese had a very sensitive period in which once they hatched the first moving object, they they deemed their mother. And if their first moving object they saw was um, Lorenz himself, then they would follow Lorenz as if he was, he was the mother. So again, there's an early period in development um, when these uh, geese hatch that they're, um, they kind of, they imprint the first moving object that they're, that they see in life as that's their caretaker. That's the one that they should follow. And, and it, it is impossible to reverse. So once they were imprinted, um, they always thought that Lorenz was the mother. And this could be detrimental, actually. If, if proper imprinting doesn't happen, uh, that can cause trouble for the rest of the animal's life because they might not be able to even recognize their own species when it comes time to mate. So for example, this condor, which is an extinct um, bird, um, has to be raised 
by a puppet so it can recognize its own species. If it's raised in a laboratory and, and hand fed by humans, it's going to be imprinted. Uh, the, the human will be imprinted on it as its mother and it will not be able to mate properly later in life. So oftentimes we have to use little props to imprint properly um, when we raise organisms in the laboratory. Um, and here's a little cartoon, right? So here this chick hatched in front of the cat and it thinks the cat's its mom. And the cat is like, um, no, I'm not. So imprinting is one way of learning, but it's a very, it's a rapid learning. Um, and it only happens in a specific time in early, um, in early development. Habituation is another way that learning affects behavior. And habituation is learning not to respond to a stimulus. So this is how, for example, we automatically tune out um, cars on the street when we're focusing, or the sounds of taxis and honking when we live in a city. And we get used to things. We learn to not respond to a stimulus because it doesn't affect us. Our brain has more important things to worry about than a, a honking car, right? So this has to be learned over time. And then we adjust based on that learning. Uh, another example is seagulls at the beach are no longer afraid of humans. They've learned that humans are not gonna shoot the seagulls. They're not gonna eat them. So they've adjusted, they've learned. Um, and here's an example of when you first put a scarecrow, the crows might be scared and think it's an actual person. But after prolonged exposure to the scarecrow, the crows are no longer scared. They've learned that there's no threat. Right? So habituation allows animals to ignore normal stimuli while remaining alert to anything that's out of the ordinary. So that's the importance of habituation. So another type of learned behaviors are found in associative learning. And in associative learning, an animal learns the relationship between two events. Um, associative learning includes operant conditioning and classical conditioning. So we'll talk about that. But what we see in associative learning is that um, a relationship is established between two events. Um, and this can oftentimes be a good thing. This can be protective and promote survival for the organism, or it can have no consequence at all. Um, so for example, uh, two related events are lightning and thunder. And when we hear thunder, we hear a loud noise, we often kind of wince from a loud noise because we're shocked. Um, but we associate lightning and thunder so strongly in our brains, and it happens so frequently, that even when we just see lightning, we sometimes wince anticipating thunder, we're anticipating the loud noise. So we automatically kind of shudder a little bit without even noticing it. Um, and again, this is just because our brain is a machine that looks for um, pattern recognition. Our brain is basically a pattern recognition machine. That's what it's supposed to do in learning, making associations between events. And it does this to try to promote our survival. But a lot of times, we kind of make false associations and our lives can be a lot more complicated because of it. But anyway, let's discuss two kinds of associative learning. The first is called operant conditioning. In operant conditioning, an animal behaves a certain way based on previous experiences. So an animal learns to associate its behavior with certain consequences and based on those consequences will change the future behavior. All right, so again, associative learning is what the umbrella term is because the animal is associating its behavior with a consequence. And based on that consequence, it will change their future behavior. So in operant conditioning, animals get conditioned to the consequences of their voluntary actions and behaviors. And voluntary is key here. So based on what the animal volunteers to do, and they look at their, they um, witness the consequences of those voluntary actions, and then we'll make a decision. Should I continue this behavior in the future? Were the consequences positive or negative? So an example, um, a famous example is um, called the Skinner box. And Skinner was a famous psychologist who pioneered the study of operant conditioning. 
and he would place an animal such as a rat inside of a box that had an electrical grid. And he showed that he could program or he could teach, right? That's the word we're learning here, where he could teach this rat to push a certain lever um, when a certain light was shown. So for example, if the blue light was on, the rat was taught to press the lever and it would get a food reward when it did that. But if it pressed the red, um, if it pressed the lever when the red light was on, it would get a shock. This is an ex this is not the exact experiment. This is the real Skinner box, but this is an analogy of the experiment. So in this way, the rat associated the treat with the blue light and associated a negative shock with the red light. And this was conditioned, this rat was conditioned, and even after it was taken out of this box, it would never press the lever when the red light was on. It just associated that with a bad consequence. It would only press the, uh, the lever when the blue light was on. So that's a form of learning, right? This is learned behavior. Um, and this animal got conditioned to the consequences of their voluntary actions. In humans, we have lots of examples of operant conditioning. Right. So if a child is given a treat as a way to stop a temper tantrum, the child may become conditioned to that behavior. This might be a bad thing, right? The child will only stop screaming if they're given a treat. We do this with our dogs, right? We give them, if we say sit and the dog sits, we give them a treat. So the dog volunteered to sit and we're promoting that with a good consequence. So the dog has learned to associate, right? the command sit and sitting with a treat. Um, another way to think about opera conditioning is if I threaten to fine students $100 every time they fail to quiz. The negative consequence of losing $100 may incentivize students to study more because they've learned that losing money is not a good thing. And the more you fail, the more money you lose. Therefore, I should study more. Sometimes we can think about gambling as operant conditioning, like in a slot machine. Every time you get a reward, we program ourselves to do the slots again. We want to gamble more, right? That's like an addiction, right? Social media is not that much different. When we get likes or we post something and we get good feedback, we want to do it more, right? We get excited. We get a rush of dopamine. And this is, again, we get conditioned to certain unhealthy behaviors um, in this way. So it's learning could be good. Uh, or it could be detrimental, right? The brain is just going to make associations. And in classical conditioning, the other type of associative learning, the animal behavior is modified by the pairing of two stimuli. And in classical conditioning, animals have an involuntary reaction toward a stimulus. This is the difference between associate, um, between operant conditioning and classical conditioning. In classical conditioning, animals have an involuntary reaction toward a certain stimulus. And the behaviors are caused by the stimulus, not the consequences of the stimulus. So that's the difference. And this might be a little tricky at first when I'm just saying it in words, but I want you to internalize it and make sense of it. In classical conditioning, behaviors are caused by the stimulus, not the consequences of the stimulus. Whereas in, uh, in uh, operant conditioning, it was all about the consequences of the stimulus, and it was a voluntary reaction. So let me example, um, I'll give you the classic example of classical conditioning is with Pavlov's dog. Right. So Pavlov's dog um, example was Pavlov would put meat powder or or something that smelled like food in front of a dog to stimulate and that would simulate um salivation and the dog didn't choose to salivate right that's an involuntary reaction toward a stimulus right? in response to food stimulus the animal involuntarily salivated but what you can do now is you can condition a certain response in the animal by if i pair a neutral stimulus with the food. So if I just blow blew a whistle, for example, the dog would not salivate. But if every time I fed the dog, I also blew a whistle, I'm conditioning the animal to have an involuntary reaction toward a stimulus. 
And after a while, after enough training, even without food, just blowing a whistle will stimulate salivation in the animal. Right. So in this case, the behavior, sal salivation, it was involuntary and it was caused by a stimulus, the whistle, not the consequences of the stimulus. It wasn't caused by the food. It was caused by just the whistle itself. So again, this is different than um, operant conditioning because operant conditioning was a voluntary action, right? So the, the dog chose to sit down and then got a treat. So it made the choice in the future to sit when it hears that command because it will get a treat. The actual um, consequence was a benefit of the treat. In classical conditioning, this dog is salivating involuntarily in response to just the stimulus itself, not any consequence of the stimulus. Uh, another example of classical conditioning is how the dog might expect a treat when he hears anything that sounds like his treat bag being opened. So even if I open up a bag of lettuce, my dog might go crazy because he's associating the sound with food, even though it's not actually the food being opened, right? And the, and the dog can't choose to not get excited. Just it's, it's getting excited because it thinks it's food. So that's classical conditioning. So to summarize operant versus classical conditioning, we could say that classical conditioning is neutral becomes natural behavior. So for example, suppose one time you took pills that gave you a stomach ache and you got very nauseous. Even the sight of a pill, which is very neutral, the sight of a pill, it could be, let's say, a vitamin D pill. That can cause natural behavior like nausea. It can actually cause you to feel sick. So something neutral, like a sight of a pill, becomes a natural behavior. And you can't control it. You really just feel sick. So classical conditioning are naturally natural bodily reactions and emotions that we can't control. So the dog salivating or us getting sick. In operant conditioning, this is choosing to behave a certain way based on consequences of a past experience. So these are behavioral choices that we make. So for example, if a child smiles just accidentally, then the father will pick him up then the, ch the child feels safe and is, is happy. So he'll associate smiling with being picked up. So now in the future, Terrell will keep smiling when he wants to be picked up by his father. Right, so that kind of behavior encourages us to repeat, or, or sorry, I should say behavior is based on the experience um, that is either encouraging us to repeat the behavior or will discourage us from doing that same behavior, right? So if we get, if, Every time Terrell screams, he gets punished. He's not going to scream as much. All right. So this is how um, animals learn, right? In associative learning, either operant conditioning or classical conditioning are parts of associative learning, making associations between um, two stimuli. So pause here and tell me if this is classical conditioning or operant conditioning. So this is an example of classical conditioning. Right. You get involuntarily nauseous from the smell of fish because of a past um, experience of having food poisoning. Right. So that's an involuntary, it's neutral, just seeing f the smell of fish is pretty neutral, um, becomes natural. You have a natural nauseous response from that. You feel better after exercising, so you work out when you're stressed. What is that an example of? Right. That's operant conditioning, right? Because of a positive consequence of a voluntary action, you're going to continue to do that action. Another type of learning is observational learning. And that's when an individual watches what another does and then imitates the behavior. So this is seen in um, a lot of different animals, so from birds and mammals. Um, so for example, a son can learn how to shave by watching his father. Or certain kinds of monkeys can learn how to wash yams by watch, by watching um, the elders wash their vegetables. Right? So observational learning is like imitation. And um, 
this could persist in groups for, for generations. So some animals, especially um, mammals and some birds, have learning abilities that extend beyond observational learning, associative learning, imprinting, and habituation. So animal cognition extends to reasoning, problem solving, tool use, and symbolic communication. So we say, you know, many mammals and birds have these cognitive abilities. And at one point we thought that only humans had these kinds of cognitive abilities. Um, but now we understand that we are not that special. <laughs> and we understand that a lot of the research is showing us that animals use a combination of operant conditioning, observational learning, um, and other insights to develop these higher uh, cognitive tools. Uh, for example, Alex, the African gray parrot, was able to recognize a hundred different objects and communicate about them. Um, this is Irene Pepperberg. She was a researcher at Brandeis while well, I was a student there. Um, and, Af uh, and Alex was uh, very popular among the Brandeis uh, population. And uh, he died, unfortunately, while I was um, a student there. But he was famous for being one of the most cognitive, cognitively able animals, um, especially for a bird, to be able to recognize um, uh, human words. It's, it's pretty astounding. Um, also, now we know that finches and crows use sticks to find insects. They use uh, tools to help find food. Um, otters use rocks to open up shellfish. Um, so it's not just uh, humans that use tools um, and that use symbols to communicate. So we know that chimpanzees right, and other great apes are able to do sign language. Um, so one chimp called Washo is able to know up to 250 words in American Sign Language, and he was able to make sentences together. Uh, some chimps were able to be trained on computer keyboards and, and could communicate with one another about where food was hidden. So again, we're not that unique in our ability to solve problems and communicate. Uh, we spoke a little bit about what makes us di distinct in the last chapter, and I uh, encourage you to look back um, at the few things that do make us unique, but we are not unique in uh, cognition. So biologists once placed innate and learned behaviors at opposite ends of the spectrum. They thought that innate behaviors were nature and learned behaviors are nurture. We now know that is not the case. We know that the gene genes and the environment interact together, right? Nature and nurture interact to determine behavior. And learning can affect our biology. So learning, but how we are nurtured, affects our nature, affects our biology, but also biology affects how we learn and what we could learn. So nature and nurture are very intimately related. A good example is with um, certain birds. So the white-crowned sparrow, uh, which is a North American bird, uh, must hear their normal song as babies at a certain point in development. If they're not exposed to their normal song, they will develop an abnormal song forever and will not be able to mate. So they're doomed. So during the first few months of life, the young male needs to hear the song from its own species. If the bird is exposed to a song of a different species, the result is no better than if the bird heard no song at all. So what does this say, right? It's not enough to say, oh, the, it's, it's nurture that matters. The bird needs to hear a song at a certain point or else it won't be able to sing. No, it's not only the song. It's naturally programmed. This bird is programmed biologically to only recognize a specific type of song, right? So when this bird is born, it is programmed to recognize only the song of its own species, right? And only if, right, the, the nature, the, the hardware is right in the bird, and it is exposed to the proper song by the proper species at the proper time, then the learning, um, uh, then the proper behavior can be developed. So nature and nurture are involved. There's a genetic factor um, that innately guides young birds to learn the correct song, right? But it's not enough just to have that genetic factor to learn the song. You still have to be exposed to the song. 
So therefore, learning um, has a genetic component um, and also the um, teaching component, like the exposure component. And every animal is born with a range of possible behavior patterns, right? We're born with sets of genes, right? We're not at the nature part. We're born with a range of possible behavior patterns uh, that are largely determined by our ancestors, right? We get half of our genes from dad, half of them from mom. Of course, these behaviors were ingrained um, in us after millions of years of evolution. But we're born with a range of possible behaviors. But we don't express all of those behaviors, right? Just like we have all these genes and we don't express all the genes of the proteins, we have all these possible behavior patterns, but we don't express all of them, right? Behavior ultimately depends on nurture, how we're raised, which depends on sociology. It depends on our environment, right? It can be natural cues. Um, it could be something like heat and temperature, or it could be the amount of stress and also timing. Right, so we are on a, um, I don't wanna say a clock, but things have to be timed appropriately in biology, right? Things develop according to a timeline. Um, so behavior does depend on timing. Like in this bird, if it was exposed to a normal song too late in development, it was as if it had no song at all. So the whole idea of nature versus nurture is very outdated, right? Because nothing is strictly innate uh, nothing is strictly learned, right? Innate behavior requires the environment, right? You can't, for example, um, you can't learn, you can't have an innate behavior without the environment there, and you can't learn without a genetic component. So nature and nurture are combined. Nature and nurture are related to each other, right? You can't learn something without the genetic component, without the predisposition to learn, right? And you can't just do something, you can't just act if there were no environment to act in. So we need nature and nurture together. So this is a summary of both innate behaviors. We said reflexes, taxis, and fixed action patterns are innate. They occur the same way each time independently of experience. But then we said that learned behaviors are behaviors that are altered as a result of an animal's experience. And we spoke about habituation, classical conditioning, operant conditioning, imprinting, and observational learning. And we finally said cognition um, includes different types of learned behaviors um, that are found in some mammalian and bird species. So let's see if you can answer this rapid response question. What behavior is most likely the result of imprinting? And the answer is B, right? Identifying close relatives. When Cleo, my cat, hears me open up a can of food, she starts to salivate. What is that an example of? So pause here. So this is an example of classical conditioning, D, right? She starts to involuntary sal involuntarily salivate in response to a very neutral stimulus. So just opening a can of food. It could have not even been her food, right? It could have been a can of beans, but she'll start to salivate. After five minutes of playing with a laser toy, Cleo ignores it. So what is that an example of? All right, so this is an example of habituation, right? They get, she got used to that stimulus, so she could then pay attention to new stimuli that might matter more. When Cleo brings, uh, hears me bringing her crate up from the basement, she starts to hide. What is that an example of? That's an example of operant conditioning. Right? She has made an association between hearing the crate and going to the vet. So she has made that, she doesn't like the consequence of the crate. So she voluntarily runs away when she hears the stimulus of the crate. So it's C, operant conditioning. Finally, after Cleo uses the litter box, she digs a hole and covers it up and runs far away. What is that an example of? And this is an example of a fixed action pattern. So back of the, or, or cats might have evolved this running, um, this running behavior after they um, 
use the bathroom to avoid any predators catching their scent. So even though Cleo doesn't even have any predators, she's still going to dig a hole in her litter box, cover it up, and then run far away after she uses it. And that could be based on some innate programming um, that can avoid predators finding where she might be. So now we'll discuss behavioral ecology, which explores the evolution of behavior patterns in a given environment. So behavioral ecology is a relatively recent approach to animal behavior that explores the environmental context and evolution of behavioral patterns. So most animal behavior can be linked to adaptations that increase survival, reproduction, or both. So we're going to talk about how animals behave to improve their survival. And many of those uh, keys to improving survival include avoiding predators. You have to avoid being eaten. You have to be able to navigate to find resources or shelter. And you have to balance your effort for foraging for food with the actual energy content of that food. So we'll talk about these um, ways that animals improve their survival. The first we said was predator avoidance. So there are many ways to avoid predator, predators, and one such way is camouflage. Right? And many animals have camouflage, which helps them become less visible by matching their background. Uh, so it decreases the chance of predation. And camouflage becomes more effective if the animal holds still um, and chooses the right background. And sometimes the animal has to position body parts in such a way to maximize camouflage. So you can see over here, this reptile is um, camouflaging with the bark of a tree, or this insect is camouflaging with the, with the dried leaves. So this insect wouldn't be able to be around um, a different color leaf, a different color tree, and be able to camouflage. So it depends on um, its environment. Another way to avoid predators is to mimic a different predator. So animals can scare off predators by acting like a predator themselves. And this is called mimicry. So for example, um, this is a caterpillar that has eye spots that resemble a snake. And this could help um, protect this caterpillar from any, any other animal that wants to eat it because they, they would be afraid of snakes. Similarly, eye spots on, um, on moths and butterflies um, keep predators away because the eye spots trigger innate fright responses in a lot of predators, just seeing these eyes, looking at them. Uh, some insects like this moth mimic more dangerous predators like this wasp. So the clear wing moth has a pattern that looks like the wasp. That, and this again helps it um, evade predators. And here we have a picture of a coral snake, which is very deadly. Um, but here is a not so deadly snake that has similar um, coloration. So again, for humans, if we saw either one of these snakes, we'd probably run the other way. Um, so we'd be scared. Uh, but this is the dangerous version, and this is the mimic. So that's mimicry. Um, another way to avoid predation is to put on defensive displays to threaten the predators. So for example, we could see that this praying mantis over here is trying to appear larger than it really is. Um, and that's a defensive display to try to scare off any predators. This snake, this is a defensive display saying, I'm toxic, I can bite you, right? Stay away. Um, so again, this is a more antagonistic way to evade predators. Um, chemical weapons also work. So like a poison dart frog, right? Uses a very, very, chem uh, very poisonous toxin to um, kill its prey or a skunk has a very noxious smell. Um, so these can either be a warning sign um, or a death threat. Um, and oftentimes these animals have markings on them that give a heads up uh, because it wouldn't be very helpful uh, for this frog if it were just um, eaten and it kills the animal, right? They would still be eaten. It would be more beneficial if it has some kind of a warning saying, stay away from me, I'm dangerous. Right? So a lot of these um, toxic animals have distinct markings and bright coloration that warn predators to stay away. 
So white might natural selection favor warning coloration in toxic animals. Right, this is what I was just trying to explain. So pause here. So the answer is B. It saves toxic animals energy from actively avoiding predators. They can just look a certain way and be avoided. So that's uh, an advantage to um, having um, warning coloration in a toxic animal. So we spoke about defensive displays before uh, where animals try to appear dangerous or larger, um, but it's also, um, animals could also use distraction displays to divert the attention of a predator away from their young. So in gazelles, they do what's called stotting. They jump up and down um, very uh, conspicuously. So predators see that. And it's actually not really understood exactly why um, gazelles do that, but it's almost saying, the gazelles are saying, look how strong I am. I can jump up and down. I could outrun you. Right. But it could also be just trying to distract any predator because it's so weird to see just something jumping up and down um, they, they might just kind of be confused and, and run away. Um, this bird pretends to be dead. So a predator won't go to its eggs and instead will try to be attracted to this bird. So this is a distraction display. This bird will try to distract a predator from its nest by faking dead and then it will fly away. So animals not only have to be, um, offensive sometimes to, def to defend themselves against predators, but they have to be defensive. And not all odd behaviors have a reason. So it's tempting to think that, oh, if you see an interesting behavior in nature, there must be a reason for that. There must be some evolutionarily adaptation, um, adaptive explanation for that. Um, but not all behaviors are adaptive. Um, so watch this video here. <laughs> so these are called fainting goats or myotonic goats. And you might think, oh, they're kind of fainting because they have some kind of, um, that might distract them, uh, distract predators, or it might do some good for them. But it actually turns out that it's a congenital disorder. It's a genetic defect um, that causes um, two kinds of muscles to contract at the same time, causing tetany or like muscle spasms. And they're just fainting. Uh, so in nature, you might see this and say, oh, how cool is that? They're trying to defend themselves in some way. Or it could just be a genetic defect. So it's good to keep that in mind. Another way to promote um, survival and avoid predators is to live in large groups. And there's a hypothesis called the selfish herd hypothesis that suggests that individuals within a large group will behave selfishly. What that means is each individual tries to position themselves in between as many of their companions as possible to avoid a predator. So being in a large group, your chances of getting eaten are a lot slimmer. And each individual tries to get um, as close to the middle as possible. And in fish, in schools of fish, we see that they form very tight groups because they try to avoid any predators. So they form very tight groups and each individual fish tries to stay as close together to the others as possible. So that's, um, so group living can offer um, a protective circle um, as well to protect the young of certain groups, of certain animals. So another way that animals improve survival is by finding food and shelter. And to find food and shelter, they have to navigate to new places. Um, so efficient movement improves survival. And there's different ways that animals might try to find its way. We have what's called piloting. They can use um, a celestial body for, for orientation, like magnetic orientation or for the sun, the moon, stars. 
or there's what's called true navigation, which we don't really understand as much. But let's talk about each. So during piloting, an animal uses distant objects or landmarks when finding its way. And in this way, it can move from one familiar place to another until the destination is reached. And there are certain ants and groups that can teach, quote unquote, others to recognize landmarks and communicate about them. So there is a leader ant in some groups that can lay down a certain pheromone at a certain location to kind of get the rest of the ants attention and say like, here, this is a landmark to remember. We need to know this one because we have to find our way back. Um, so this is the desert ant showing this. These um, guys live in Tunisia and they eat dead insects, um, but they have to find those dead insects in the desert. So they leave their home and they go all around to search. They just keep on migrating around. And once they find their food, they take a shortcut back home. They take the almost the shortest path possible back. So how can they possibly know the quickest path back, right? Once they got over here, they followed the green path to get here. How do they know to take the quickest path back? Well, that's piloting. And again, we know that um, ants can recognize certain objects um, as landmarks and also use pheromones, some chemical signals as well to help pilot their way back home. Other animals use celestial bodies or the Earth's magnetic field to navigate. So African mole rats detect the magnetic field to navigate in the dark. Birds have magnetic particles um, in the upper beak uh, that can actually figure out um, where north is. So it can act like a compass. That's how like homing pigeons work. They have built-in compasses. Um, other animals that use the sun are fish, birds, sea turtles, butterflies, bees, reptiles, and ants. So a lot of um, animals use the sun um, to know where they're going as a, as a point of reference. In true navigation, which is pretty rare, um, this requires that an animal in a very unfamiliar terrain can understand its position and return home, even without relying on a stimulus from the destination. So for example, um, the spiny lobster is known, um, the spiny lobster, uh, the sea turtle, and the homing pigeon are, are examples of those that use true navigation. Um, you can take a lobster and blind it, so to speak, and put it somewhere distant, far away, and then it would automatically know how to get back home. And true navigation probably use, uses a combination of all the types of um, piloting we spoke about already. There could be a combination of factors. And again, we have no idea how a lobster perceives the world. So uh, this spiny lobster might have senses that we cannot possibly perceive or study. So there's still a lot of debate on how animals use true navigation. Right, so us humans, we use a couple of different um, ways. We use mostly piloting. Like we can look at landmarks and we figure out um, uh, where to go, right? And we have landmarks like street signs, for example, that tell us exactly um, where to go. And there's also what's called path integration, where animals can estimate their present position by calculating how far and in what direction they've traveled from their previous position. So that's what the desert ants did right and when it was when it was trying to move around um, it not only looked at the landscape around it in piloting but it also took into account how far and how fast it went in each direction so taken together these are all ways um, in behavioral ecology that animals improve their survival these are all animal behaviors that improve survival in a certain environment all right this is all under the category of behavioral ecology the last part of behavioral ecology we'll talk about is in foraging for food. So animals have to minimize the energy spent foraging for food to maximize the energy gain of actually eating the food. So there has to be a trade-off. Um, and there's a theory called optimal foraging theory that predicts that an animal's food finding strategy maximizes the amount of energy. So for example, crows that eat snails must first break the shell. 
and they automatically choose the larger snails because they've learned that the larger snails have the most meat. In order to break the snail's shell, the bird has to pick up the snail, fly high with it, and then drop it on the rock. So researchers predicted in a laboratory, they, did, they figured out what is the right height to drop the shell from to break it. What's the minimum, um, what is the minimum height needed to break the shell? And they predicted that dropping snails from a height of five meters would be the most efficient way to break the snail, uh, to break the snail shell. And sure enough, when studied in nature, the crows actually drop snails from an average of 5.2 meters. And they also provide, uh, prefer the larger snails, so they maximize food intake while minimizing effort. So by looking at this data, the birds figured out that if they just go to five feet, I'm uh, sorry, five meters high, and they did six drops, a total of 30 flight heights, that would give them the ability to break open the shell. And that's what the scientists found as well. So there's this optimal, um, there's an optimal balance between the effort required and the um, energy that you're going to receive from the food. Some animals have evolved some very unique behaviors to communicate the presence and the location of food sources. Um, and a good example of that is the waggle dance in bees. So I'd like you to watch this video. Honeybees have some fascinating abilities, among them being able to communicate by performing a unique dance. It informs hive mates where a newly discovered food source is located. Every cycle of this waggle dance roughly describes the shape of the figure eight. Let's rewind and look in more detail. The bee only waggles on a part of its route, the straight run, indicated here by the waved line. The secret lies in the direction of the straight run, or to be more precise, in the angle between the straight run and the perpendicular, which in this case is 90 degrees to the left. This tells the other bees that food is available 90 degrees to the left of the sun. If the angle is 60 degrees to the right, they'll be flying 60 degrees to the right of the sun. So the waggle dance in bees is a really cool example of an animal behavior. And this was discovered by one of the founders of ethology, Carl von Frisch. Um, before we move on to the second part of the lecture, um, I just want to go back to when we spoke about proximate and ultimate causations of behavior. So for all the behaviors we spoke about, you should be able to think about the how, like how can this behavior occur, right? How could the bee have done the waggle dance, right? Using its um, hormones and, and exoskeleton, etc. But then we have to think about the ultimate cause. Why is this behavior adaptive? And the waggle dance, we could say, well, it helps um, related bees find food. So it promotes the, the longevity and the health of the colony. Um, so here's some other examples found in the book, approximate and ultimate causes. And you should just understand um, the distinction between them. So, so far, we discussed um, how animals learn. We discussed how animals protect themselves and adapt to their environment um, in order to survive. And now we're going to talk about reproductive um, behaviors. And most reproductive activities fall into the category of social behaviors. Um, and the field of sociobiology attempts to understand social behavior in the context of an animal's fitness. So social behaviors that promote reproductive success include courtship, mating, and parental care. So these are all considered social behaviors, right? Courtship, mating, and parental care are social behaviors that promote reproductive success and survival. So now we're gonna talk about those. So courtship sets the stage for mating. And many species have very elaborate courtship behaviors uh, that all lead to copulation, right? We spoke about fruit flies. We said there's a set of like six steps that have to happen in courtship before mating could occur. And courtship has many functions. Um, one major function is so species can identify one another. Um, each species has a specific courtship display. So this allows the species um, individual to recognize another member. So you can actually have um, 
successful matings. Another courtship function is to stimulate hormonal changes in the participants. Um, so for example, in cats, when the male cat bites on the female cat's neck, that stimulates the production of hormones and it can initiate ovulation. Same, uh, this is, there's so many examples of this. Um, so as part of courtship, this can often stimulate hormonal changes. Um, for example, initiating ovulation in females. And finally, courtship allows animals to assess the quality of their mates, right? Um, depending on what they do and how they act, that can indicate if they're very healthy and strong, or maybe if they have a lot of parasites and um, are not are not very um, uh, good, would not make very good parents. So courtship, again, helps identify species, trigger hormonal changes, and helps assess the quality of mates. One of the best studied examples of how courtship leads to hormonal states or changes in hormonal states is in the ring dove. So when the male has enough building materials, the male ring dove will start courting the female uh, with a certain display. And once that display happens, then the female's brain will start releasing FSH, follicle stimulating hormone, that will get her to start making eggs. And this, in turn, um, will lead to egg incubation. The male, when he starts, um, when he senses the female, he will also start secreting progesterone from the testes, which will block um, any further courtship and aggression, and will then help the male um, incubate the egg along with the female. So both the male and female doves um, need to incubate the egg. You don't have to know that for the example, um, for any quiz or anything, but it's a whole series of events that happen in courtship. So some courtship displays are really remarkable to look at. So I'd like you to access this video um, and just get a, uh, take a look at some of these birds of paradise. In the great island of New Guinea, there are 42 different species of birds of paradise, each more bizarre than the last. So you can see just how elaborate some of these courtship displays can be. And again, these are done to make sure that mating is done between members of the same species. You, um, these displays can offer, um, often trigger some kind of hormonal changes in members of the opposite sex to like trigger ovulation that's necessary for mating. And finally, courtship allows different animals to assess the quality of their mates. So maybe the birds of paradise with the most colorful um, displays would be preferred. And that leads us to the next topic of sexual selection. And we spoke to sexual selection, we spoke about sexual selection already um, as the variation in the ability of individuals to obtain mates. And if there is a lot of sexual selection um, in a certain species, that can lead to what's called sexual dimorphism, right? A situation in which the two sexes look very different from one another. So we spoke about this already. We know that, for example, cats and dogs are not very sexually dimorphic. Um, there is some sexual dimorphism in uh, male and female humans, right? Males tend to be slightly taller, more muscular um, than females, for example. Um, but there are much uh, more distinct examples. So the cuttlefish male is a lot larger than a female and has a brighter pattern on its skin during the breeding season. Um, and when you have sexual selection, so maybe females only preferred very larger, very large cuttlefish males. And over time, that would pressure the males to be bigger, right? The smaller males would not be mated with. So that would select for the larger males. That's what sexual selection is talking about. And sexual selection leads to sexual dimorphism, choosing one extreme over the other. Um, the book presents this interesting hypothesis that females are typically the choosier sex. I don't like the way that sounds already, um, but let's 
talk about it. Um, is this hypothesis correct? Are females typically choosier than, than males? And I don't like to generalize, but biologically speaking, in general, females produce relatively small numbers of very large gametes compared to the male. And tons of energy is invested by the female in raising offspring and producing the egg. Uh, so think about the case of humans, right? Females need to, um, they're pregnant for nine months. And after that, they have to lactate. And arguably, it's going to be another 18 years be before the uh, mothers are off the hook right, from raising their kids. Males, on the other hand, produce many very tiny sperm that contain just a half a set of chromosomes. So there's a huge difference um, in the investment that a, a female would have to put into children versus uh, males would have to put into children. So this disparity in gamete size, along with the energy investment uh, required to raise offspring, suggests that females should be more choosy. They should be more selective, whereas males um, don't have to be as selective. And there are studies done in um, in college students that show that men may perform. They, they actually do prefer more sexual partners throughout life than females. And men are more likely to make sexual decisions with less information about the female. So um, experimentally speaking, um, there are studies that show that males are less choosy than females. Um, so this, again, I could argue, well, this is only done in college students and this was done in the West. Uh, but actually many experiments um, support this that were done in different cultures. Uh, so over, uh, I forgot the exact percentage, but um, in many different societies, uh, the man, man seems to be less choosy than the female. So there are many different types of animal mating systems. And the reproductive behaviors vary between different animals. Uh, broadly speaking, we could say that animals can be either monogamous or polygamous. In a monogamous mating system, neither the male nor the female has another sexual partner. And depending on the species, a monogamous relationship may be just for a breeding season. That's mostly the case. Right? It'll be one male with one female per breeding season, or it can last a lifetime. Uh, for example, puffins form a lifetime monogamous uh, pair. Um, and in monogamous mating systems, males and females both typically provide care of the offspring. And we see this most in birds and in small mammals. So birds and small mammals are often monogamous. And that's in cases in which both the male and the female both have to take care of their offspring. We'll talk about why this is in the next, um, in a couple slides. The opposite of monogamy is polygamy, in which either the male or the female have multiple partners of the opposite sex. So for example, female chipmunks have multiple partners during their estrus period, which lasts only six to seven hours. So they can have multiple males um, try to fertilize them within a certain, um, certain period of time. And in polygamous mating systems, males are not likely to care for their young. Because if, the, and, and mostly in part because they cannot be confident which young are theirs. So let's think about this. In a, it's in a polyandrous situation where there are multiple, uh, multiple males mating with a female, the males are not likely to care for their young because it could have been any male that uh, sired the child, right? They're not confident which child belongs to them. So in polygamous mating systems, oftentimes the males um, leave the females and then just go to another female right away. Um, again, because they're not confident in their paternity. But in polygamous mating systems, males can increase their confidence in paternity in several ways. Oftentimes, males will guard the female after copulation to make sure another male doesn't come in. Sometimes males can actually scoop out sperm that was already in the female um, from a different male and replace it. And some animals like uh, the Australian redback spider, after mating with the female, offers itself as 
a food source. So it actually feeds the female its body to enhance the chance that um, its sperm will be fertilized or that its sperm will fertilize the egg and produce baby spiders that are very strong. All right, so this is a way for the male spider to guarantee its paternity or to help ensure its paternity if it's basically offering itself up as a nuptial gift. Right, the female will be more likely to then eat that male and then not mate with another male. So overall, who cares for their offspring depends on a few things, right? It's the size of investment to care for their offspring. So if the female, um, like for, for mammals, um, for example, there's a huge investment of energy to care for offspring. Right, the females have to put in a lot more energy than the males do. They also have to take into account the cost of missed opportunities and caring for offspring. So while I'm caring for this offspring, am I missing out on opportunities to care for other offspring? Right. So you can't, you don't want to. So for, for a male, for example, you kind of, uh, uh, in a male situation, you are missing out on opportunities of mating if you're taking care of your children, which explains um, why some males don't take care of their children in these kinds of mating systems, right? And it's also the confidence of paternity and maternity, right? The more confident a father is, the more likely he is to care for the offspring. So that's why um, in amphibians and fish, for example, males take care of their offspring because eggs are laid outside where the males can visit, visibly see them. They know which eggs they fertilize. So in those kinds, when you have external fertilization, males can be more confident in their paternity and they will be more likely to take care of those eggs. Compare that to um, internal fertilization, like in mammals, Right. Larger mammals, we're not quite sure of who the father is. So fathers are less likely to take care of their, their children. And although we like to think about our society as being monogamous, um, the data contradicts that largely. Um, it is favorable and it is in vogue to be in um, nuclear families. Right? And uh, a lot of it has to do with religion. Um, and how this came to be with like a ma, a father and a mother has children on their property, but this was not the case. Humans were never um, in nuclear families, um, you know, before a few thousand years ago. We lived in large groups. Um, and in fact, um, when studying all, um, all different kinds of populations across the world, it was discovered that about 85% of civilizations of known societies um, have polygamy, which is men have more than one wife. So over 85% of known societies have um, polygamy, specifically polygyny, which is where men have multiple wives. So um, humans are not as monogamous as we might think. And again, this is explained by the size of investment to care, right? You need a lot, the female has to invest a lot of energy and time to carry the offspring and would not miss out on much if she cares for the offspring. And she could be very confident that she is the mother because it comes out of her. So that's what explains that the female would care for the offspring in, in humans. And I could talk a lot more about this, but we have a lot, um, we have some more slides to talk about. So we'll leave it there for now. Now let's talk about societies. So social behaviors are, occur in groups called societies. And a society is a group of individuals of the same species that is organized in a cooperative manner. We know that cooperation is key to survival. Um, a good example of societies are these naked mole rats that live in colonies where there are non-reproducing members that care for the young produced by the queen. There's a division of labor. The queen produces the young. And there are other um, mole rats that do not produce themselves. They're non-reproducers, and they just care for the young produced by the queen. This is a division of labor, right? This is, again, um, a, a good way to cooperate and to maximize um, 
maximize survival and reproduction. And this might be similar to how humans used to be, right? We used to live in groups where not every person, um, so we used to live in groups of about 150, 10,000 years ago. And theoretically, not every human needed to reproduce in that group. Some would reproduce and have children, and those children would be taken care of by the non-reproducers, right? So again, not everything is about reproduction. It's about survival, right, and cooperation. So one type of social structure that promotes the most cooperation is eusociality. And eusocial animals are the most developed, um, have the most developed societies. So just like the, the mole rats we spoke about before, they divide labor, especially in reproduction, right? So the non-parents, even um, non-parents will take care of children, right? You don't only have parents taking care of children. And the non-reproductive adults help take care of the reproductive adults. So the ones that don't reproduce help the ones that do reproduce. And furthermore, the offspring help raise their younger siblings. So in this way, we have maximum cooperation. And it's not all about everyone just reproducing on their own. That's not often beneficial, right? Look at the world now with overpopulation. Everyone wants to have their own children, their own family. But oftentimes, we don't need just more and more reproduction. Um, so ants, bees, termites, and naked mole rats divide the labor, um, especially in reproduction. And this allows them to maintain cooperation. And um, again, it's a, it's a really important way to stay in groups. So there's a lot of good benefits of staying in a group, but there are some disadvantages. So I want you to take a second, pause here and think about the benefits of living in a group and the disadvantages of living in a group. So overall, group living can increase your chance of survival because it can offer defense against predators, right? We said before, like the selfish herd hypothesis, when you're in a big group, you're less likely to be singled out by a predator. These meerkats over here are watching for potential threats. And when one barks an alarm call, the entire community will dash underground to safety. So it's beneficial to live in a group because you'll have some security guards, right? Also, group living makes it easier to find food and resources. You could divide up the labor. Some can find food and bring it to the rest and share. There are some disadvantages, however, right? It has some costs. If you're living in a group, you might have competition between your group members, right? Because you're more likely to compete for the same sources and that might lead to aggression. Also, if you're living in a group, it might be easier for you, for you to be noticed by a predator if you're in a large group compared to just a single organism on its own. Another thing, group living might promote the spread of diseases and, par and parasites. Um, so again, it's a, it's a balance. You don't want the group to be too large and you don't want the group to be too small. Establishing dominant hierarchies decreases competition in groups by reducing the time, energy, and risk of fighting. So dominant hierarchies helps mitigate any competition between group members. Um, so what this means is there's often uh, a hierarchy of, of those that are dominant, um, basically like a um, seniority list, right, where the older members or the strongest have more control than the younger um, or weaker members of a group. And another way to reduce competition is to occupy a territory. So when animals kind of agree on a certain territory, they avoid the need to um, constantly keep neighbors out. Right? There's kind of an understanding of where each animal's territory is. And they can mark um, territories with chemical signals, um, like leaving down uh, urine scents, or they could actually um, signal with with loud noises. So whenever an animal um, crosses the territory, they would be alerted like an alarm system. So dominant hierarchies and having territories established helps minimize any competition and fighting and aggression. Right? All this is helping animals cooperate. So a good example of animal cooperation is in ground squirrels. And ground squirrels make alarm calls when they see a predator nearby. 
And this, of course, brings attention to this ground squirrel. It makes it more likely to be eaten. But by making a loud noise, it's protecting all of the rest of the ground squirrels around. So this is a way to, for it to cooperate and help the others. But why is this behavior adaptive? So this kind of behavior is adaptive because it can be altruistic. This is a social behavior that is altruistic. And altruism is when an animal sacrifices its own reproductive fitness for the good of others. So this squirrel is, is sacrificing its own ability to pass on its genes for the good of others. And cooperation between members of a group benefits all. We spoke about this um, in a different class, but cooperation, we are programmed to cooperate. We are programmed to be kind to one another. And it feels good when we do that, right? Just like it feels good when we eat or we have sex, because those are things that we need to survive and reproduce. It feels good when we're kind and cooperate because that's what we need to survive and reproduce. So it might seem like an like a, a paradox, like why would this squirrel risk its own life um, if it won't be able to pass on its genes? Well, this might prevent other of its squirrel friends and family from being eaten by the predator. So there are two types of fitness. There's direct fitness, which is the reproductive success of an individual and its direct descendants. So it's me and my children. There's also indirect fitness, which is the reproductive success of non-descendant relatives. So this can be cousins, for example. So inclusive fitness is the term that defines the combined total of direct and indirect fitness. So we want to try to maximize inclusive fitness overall. So we said an individual's inclusive fitness is the sum of direct and indirect fitness. And individuals try to behave to maximize their inclusive fitness. Right? The most familiar way to maximize fitness is to help your own offspring to survive and reproduce directly. But it's also, um, you could still improve your fitness by um, maximizing indirect fitness, taking care of nieces, nephews, and cousins, all right? And when you think about it, if I take care of my offspring, they share 50% of my DNA, whereas my nieces and nephews have 25% of my DNA. But if I can protect two of my nieces and nephews, that's like saying the same thing as protecting my one child, right? Or like my first cousins have one eighth the genetic, um, uh, my first cousin has one eighth of my DNA. But by taking care of just, you know, four of um, four of my first cousins, that's like taking care of one of my own children, right? So this is, again, just showing us how um, indirect fitness plays a role in inclusive fitness. It's not just taking care of me, of my direct children um, and di their direct descendants. Right? It's also my non-descendant relatives that overall share my genes and will pass those genes on in the population. So this brings us to kin selection, which explains a type of altruism when an individual reduces its direct fitness while assisting the survival and reproduction of non-descendant relatives, meaning it's increasing its indirect fitness. And this is what we saw with that ground squirrel, right? The ground squirrel was reducing its direct fitness because it could have been eaten first, but it increased the indirect fitness because all of the little cousins, a little squirrel cousins were then spared and were not eaten by the predator, right? So we're overall trying to increase inclusive fitness in kin selection. There is a, um, an equation um, that that roughly determines whether altruism will occur, where B is the benefit, it's the fitness benefit to the recipient, and C is the cost of the altruist. So basically, let me just uh, break it down. Altruism will occur if the benefit outweighs the cost, right? If more benefit can happen than the cost. But we multiply the benefit by the degree of relatedness. So if I'm very related to somebody, right? That's going to drive me to do something despite a cost. So compare, So let's say my R is 0.5. I have 50% uh, genes related. 
that means my benefit will be a lot larger, right? Than if my relatedness is only 10%, right? The benefit won't be as great if I'm less related. So I'm less likely to do something that's costly to my fitness if I'm less related, right? So this just shows the more you can, in, you want to increase your inclusive fitness overall. That's how organisms act. They behave to increase their um, inclusive fitness. There's also what's called reciprocal altruism, where animals may help non-relatives. So even if they're not related at all, um, sometimes we see that animals can cooperate with other animals. And in reciprocal altruism, individuals help others at a cost to themselves if they are likely to be paid back later. So we see this um, in a few examples, like in vampire bats. Vampire bats can share, regurgitate blood to members that are not related to them, but they keep note of who they gave blood to, and those expect to be given blood back and at a later time. So again, this reciprocal altruism keeps us in check, um, keeps people in check, but it's not for free. People don't just do good deeds um, without expecting something back. Um, and this is an interesting uh, little diagram here, right? If two people are both benefited by something, we call that cooperation. If somebody is benefited, at, somebody benefits at the cost of another, we call that altruism. Right? If somebody um, benefit comes at somebody else's cost, right? That's selfishness, right? We do something for your own benefit, even though it's at a cost, that's selfish. And if you do something that costs something that causes somebody else a cost, that's just being spiteful, right? You're doing something that hurts you and costs and hurts the other person. Um, so we were talking about altruism here, but in the end, we're saying that altruism always has some kind of benefit. Right? There's always some kind of benefit. It's not all cost. And the emotion of guilt may have evolved in some social mammals to keep selfishness in check. So guilt is not just reserved to humans. All right? And the idea of empathy may have evolved to support cooperation. If I can feel what another person is feeling, then I'm less likely to cause that person pain. Right? If I can relate myself to that. Same idea as guilt, right? If I, the emotion of guilt would keep me in check. I know that if I steal something, I'm going to, I know that somebody else might feel that they can steal from me. So I'm going to feel, I'm going to have a negative sensation after I steal something. And that's my, my body telling me this might not be what's best for me and my group, right? This might, may, um, may backfire in the long run. Um, and empathy might have evolved as an offshoot of the maternal altruistic bond. So all mothers, at a cost to themselves, take care of their young. So possibly the same neural mechanisms that allow for mothers to care for their children um, might be behind empathy between uh, members of the same species or even between different species, right? We have empathy with gorillas. When we see a gorilla hurt, we, we feel their pain and we want to save them. Right, when we're at our best. So one thing that really sets humans apart from other animals is our ability to cooperate in large groups. But that raises an interesting question. Right? How did we get our ability to cooperate in large groups? And how did that even form? And we could go way back uh, thousands and thousands of years and we could think about how we used to get food. We used to forage, right? hunt and gather, um, so gathering fruit can be done as a single person task, but you're not getting as much um, nutrition and energy. And you have to spend a lot of time climbing trees, picking fruit to eat that. However, if there are large mammals around um, in the plains, you could just kill one large animal and be fed for many, many, many days. And you could even divide that, that meat up amongst all of your, your tribe. So hunting meat requires group cooperation. So those individuals that were most successful at forming bands, working together and cooperating, were able to capture um, and hunt for meat the best. And that would, again, promote cooperation and food sharing and also a sense of fairness, right? They would have to, the person who killed the animal might get 
first dibs, um, for example. And if it's not going to be the same person who goes out hunting all the time, right? They would divide up the labor of hunting. So because we were pressured in a way, if we, if we didn't want to hunt, um, gather for fruit, those that were able to cooperate in groups were better off because we were able to eat large mammals. And in general, carnivores are generally bigger brains than herbivores. So more energy is required. So this, again, if we do eat meat, we um we do there is a correlation between having bigger brains and that would force us we need to be able to cooperate to capture meat and the ability to consume lots of cooked animal protein might have catalyzed our bigger brains and again i spoke about this last time was because we discovered fire we could cook protein and not have to spend as much time digesting our food so not only that, we can do other things. We have, we could spend more time hunting and uh, forming societies, uh, but also our digestive tract didn't need to do as much work and our brain uh, had more energy to use to grow. So instead of our digestive tract getting um, larger to digest the raw food, our brains might've got larger from eating the cooked food. So this is um, an idea uh, that's very hard to prove, but it's a very interesting one. So we would assume that these humans hunting in groups had to be very fair, right? They had to share amongst each other and they had to have these um, rules in mind, right? Of what was acceptable, what was, what was ethical and what was um, unethical. And this is not limited to just humans. So I want you to watch this video of capuchin monkeys. And I want you to tell me um, if fairness and morality is limited to only humans. So a final experiment that I want to mention to you is our fairness study. Uh, and so this, this, this became a very famous study and there's now many more because after we did this about 10 years ago, uh, it became uh, very well known. And we did that originally with capuchin monkeys and uh, I'm going to show you the first experiment that we did. It has now been done with dogs and with birds and with chimpanzees. Um, with, but with Sarah Brosnan, we started out with capuchin monkeys. So what we did is we put two capuchin monkeys side by side. Again, these animals, they live in a group. They know each other. We take them out of the group, put them in a test chamber. And there's a very simple task that they need to do. And if you give both of them cucumber for the task, the two monkeys side by side, they're perfectly willing to do this 25 times in a row. So cucumber, even though it's really only water in my opinion, but cucumber <laughs> is perfectly fine for them. Now, if you give the partner grapes, the, the food preferences of my capuchin monkeys correspond exactly with the prices in the supermarket. And so if you give them grapes, it's a far better food, uh, then you create inequity between them. So that's the experiment we did. Recently, we videotaped it with new monkeys who had never done the task, uh, thinking that maybe they would have a stronger reaction, and that turned out to be right. The one on the left is the monkey who gets cucumber. The one on the right is the one who gets grapes. The one who gets cucumber, note that the first piece of cucumber is perfectly fine. The first piece she eats. Uh, then she sees the other one getting grape and you will see what happens. So she gives a rock to us, that's the task. And we give her a piece of cucumber and she eats it. The other one needs to give a rock to us. And that's what she does. And she gets a grape. And she eats it. The other one sees that. She gives a rock to us now, gets again cucumber. She tests the rock now against the wall. She needs to give it to us. And she gets cucumber again. <laughs> so this is basically the Wall Street protest that you see here. So from experiments like this, we see that morality and fairness are not just limited to us humans. Uh, so what do you think? Do animals have emotions? So pause here and tell me what you think. So this is a tough one. And the best answer would be C. Some have emotions similar to humans. 
as far as we know. Um, but some do not. All right, so some animals, um, like an ant, might not necessarily have emotions. Whereas a capuchin monkey, as we just saw, it seems to have emotions similar to humans. But we first have to define what an emotion is. An emotion is a bodily experience produced by hormones, glands, neurotransmitters, etc. It's a physiological process. So happiness and joy could be caused by the neurotransmitters dopamine, for example. Right. Um, whereas guilt is a different emotion that could be caused by different neurotransmitters. So emotions are joy, fear, rage, guilt, shame, pride. And these may be conscious or unconscious. Sometimes we're not even aware that we feel very guilty inside. We can't even label those emotions. So do animals have emotions? Right. Write this again. We know that many mammals, especially social mammals, would have emotions. Right. Why wouldn't um, a, a cow or a dog feel some form of fear or joy? And we often talk about puppy shame, right? The dogs have shame. And again, it's very dangerous to kind of compare human shame with other animals because we don't know what other animals actually experience. Um, but there's a lot of, I'm going to recommend a great book, um, a great book on that in a couple of slides. But an emotion is different from a feeling, right? An emotion is a physiological experience. A feeling is a subjective awareness of that experience. So that's when it has to be conscious. So feelings are private experiences that varies between individuals. So for example, certain neurotransmitter usually would lead to joy in most people, but that same neurotransmitter might produce a different feeling um, in you based on your previous experience. Maybe you associate some kind of a, an emotion with a negative experience. So you have a different feeling because of it. So do animals have feelings? And again, these are open to interpretation. This would be a good group discussion. And emotions try to drive us to do what's right. They guide us in the right direction, but they do not dictate the course of action. And emotions are there over, again, they were caused by evolutionary pressures in our environment that selected for different behaviors. And these emotions, again, drive us to do certain behaviors, but they don't dictate exactly what behavior we're going to do. They allow for flexibility and they also provide meaning to experiences. So that's why emotions are very helpful. All right. So we could ask the question, are feelings even necessary? Um, and you would argue that they're not 100% necessary, but they are, they exist. So this becomes a philosophical uh, conversation from here. So I'd like to end with a video called Mama's Last Hug that just shows how much we have in common with other animals. Um, and we should never have this idea that humans um, are this supreme being that's totally distinct from the rest of the animal kingdom. So you can watch the whole video down here, um, but I'm gonna play it um, at the end. And I'd also like you to watch this TED talk on animal minds um, before the end. So let's watch Mama's Last Hug first.
So you can watch the rest of that um, video if you'd like. It's a very um, powerful video that just shows how much we have in common um, with our fellow primates. And here's a video on animal minds that again just illustrates um, how much um, or, or how much uh, confusion there was about how humans are different and how in fact animals have a lot of the abilities that we thought were reserved for only humans. So that's this is an important video to watch. Um, there's also a great episode on animal intelligence um, in the Netflix show Explained. I think it's a really good one on animal intelligence you should watch. Um, Mama's Last Hug, if you was um, a book that I was talking about before that explains animal emotions and what we can learn about ourselves from studying ethology. And this was based on that video I just showed of Mama's Last Hug. Another book I really recommend is Animal Wise um, that talks about how we know that animals really do think and feel. So that is officially the end, and I hope you enjoyed uh, this lesson especially. Um, thank you for a great semester, and please complete course evaluations. Thank you for your time, and I look forward to seeing you again soon in a different class. Pru